thank you for, for your giving. Uh, so, let me find something here I want to share with you. So every once in a while, I'll get involved with uh, relationships with people that are fighting. How many ever had a little spousal argument? Three people tell the truth, Lord. <laughs> well, a judge was interviewing a Texas woman regarding her pending divorce, and he asked her, what are the grounds for your divorce? She said, about four acres and a nice little home in the middle of the property with a stream running by. No, he said, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, what is the foundation of this case? Well, it's made of concrete, brick, and mortar, she replied. No, I mean, what are your relations like? Well, I have an aunt and an uncle, 12 cousins living here in town, as well as my husband's parents. The judge took a deep breath. Uh, do you have a real grudge? grudge? And uh, 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 she says, no, we have a two-car car part, and we've never really needed one because we, we don't have a car. Please, he tried again. Is there any infidelity in your marriage? Yes, both my son and daughter have stereo sets, and we don't necessarily like the music, all that hip-hop rap trap, but we can't seem to do anything about it. Ma'am, does your husband beat you up? Yes, he gets up before me every morning, and, <laughs> and he makes the coffee. Finally, in frustration, the judge asked, Lady, why do you want a divorce? Oh, I don't want a divorce, she said. I've never wanted a divorce. My husband does. He says he just can't seem to communicate with me. <laughs> you got that problem. Sometimes you just, you know, our humanity, we just causes us problems. And sometimes it's just worth laughing at just a little bit. Uh, I want to bless a family that Bill Gaspar went through cancer, had a lot of uh, issues, uh, just lots of expenses and that, and then through deaths of some of the family being off of work. And, and so, I, you know, they didn't ask me. They didn't know I was going to do this, but I really feel like we should bless the Gaspars. And so if I could get some help with a dollar blessing and just be generous, and let's, let's just bless the socks off of them, and if you would. And uh, thank you for helping me, guys. So just pass. We're not da passing a bag. What we do is you just pass down the aisle a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, whatever you got to bless them. Well, tonight, don't miss it if you're 18 to 23. They're going to be having great meals, a great band. It's going to be an awesome event over at the, uh, over at the youth center. My, uh, our, uh, pastor, we, us pastors will send our message to each other and have them read. And uh, so th the different pastors have read this, this sermon that uh, Austin is preaching t tonight. And let me tell you, I almost said, why don't you preach that this morning because it is a whale of a sermon. I hope that you guys will... Go out of your way to get there and bring someone. I know you're going to really, really enjoy it. Well, this family series is whether you're married or single or divorced or widowed, you're a part of a family. And I truly believe all of you will be ministered to if you just will listen to these messages. And I'm not sure how many there will be, but I know at least three. And, uh, and then I, I'm going to be going with the tour to Israel and for a couple weeks or so. And... and um, but I, I just hope that you'll really not tune this out. Young people, listen to me. There's great, rich truth in this message this morning. Please don't tune it out. Turn to Genesis chapter 3 in your Bible. I don't know if you realize it or not, but we all have characteristics from the first family. And I'm not talking about the Trumps. I'm talking about Adam and Eve. No matter what your tribe or ethnicity or your race or where you came from in the world, we're all descendants from Adam and Eve, and we each have physical characteristics from them. And uh, I also believe we have biological characteristics from them, and we have spiritual genetics because of the fall of man into sin. The fallen family, we are all fallen, and we need redemption, and we need God every day to change and help us to live what God intended for mankind in the beginning. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. Before the fall of man, every person on earth, well, what, just a couple, but they were perfect in relationship with each other and with God. And uh, in just a few verses, all that changed. The relationship between them 
was broken between God and them were broken. It drastically changed. As we read now, in one second, what entered into the world was sin and what sin brought in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Right away, he makes you doubt the word. He makes you doubt what God said. That's the devil, folks, questioning God, always questioning the word of God. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Now, again, Satan, the liar and father of liars, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it, and then their eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. Now listen to me. Notice, notice if you will, that the first thing that came to them is they realized something had changed in them when all this went down and they sinned. And the first thing, point one, that happened was that shame for the first time entered to this earth. Adam and Eve had never experienced fear or experienced shame, but shame came to them. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. If you live in shame, it will change how you interact with everyone, with your friends, with your spouse, with your children, with your parents. Shame changes things. You've got to get free from guilt and shame. Jesus died for the purpose, and he will free you and forgive you if you'll only turn to him. As we continue in verse 7, you'll see the shame that hit them immediately. Again, the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, Genesis 3, 7. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden. Now, I want you to notice in verse 7, they sewed fig trees together and made coverings for themselves because they were naked in front of each other. You see that? God, it wasn't, that's what they did. God wasn't there. They weren't hiding from God because God wasn't there. And then in verse 8, God comes walking by. They heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Now, ladies, that's been going on for a long time. <laughs> that, that, those men, that, that's been going on a long time right there. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the devil made me do it. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now let me just tell you something, guys. Right there, immediately, in just, just a moment, shame took over so that they were hiding and hiding from God. He says, uh, before they tried to hide from God, they hid from each other. You notice that. I pointed that out. The first thing that comes after sin is shame and the shame of being naked. You find this concept throughout Scripture. And when it's talking about the shame of being naked, listen to me. It's not just talking about spirit, physical nakedness. It's a spiritual nakedness that would pull down. They were changed spiritually as well in that rebellion to disobey God. You find it throughout the Bible. Like look, for instance, at Revelation 3, 18, the King James Version which has the, the correct uh, wording here. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold, and I'm just, uh, we're going to read a part of it. Counsel buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. 
So immediately, the shame of nakedness happens to Adam and Eve. And, you know, growing up, I had the shame of nakedness, man. I mean, you just know it from a kid. I tell the fifth graders, I said, nobody, you got privates, nobody looks, and you don't, and, and nobody touches. You don't look, and you don't touch, and it doesn't change till you get married. I don't care what the morals of our country are. That's the biblical morals. It does not change. And, um, and so... Um, here, here, you know, as a kid, I was so skinny, I had to run around the shower to get wet, and I didn't want anybody seeing that, that naked, skinny body of mine. Now I got a different problem, the reason I keep clothes on. <laughs> Some of you gained the same problem. <laughs> now think about this. Adam and Eve, they're married. Adam says, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You are a woman because you came out of me. Man, they're one. It's like this. Listen to me. They are so one. It's like Mr. and Mrs. Weaver. See what I'm saying? One. You understand what I'm saying? Not two individuals. They are one. One flesh. Bone of bone, flesh of flesh. So much so. And when they sinned, that was splintered. That was broken. No longer. You'll see. We'll look at that in just a minute. You know, I mean... They're married. I mean, who was looking at them? They were the only people on earth. I mean, the animals. I mean, I don't mind being naked in front of a dog. A dog doesn't know any difference. Is that wrong to say? It is? I should have had someone edit this. I should have sent this to <laughs> co-pastor Hill. I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's wrong to say that. I just disagree with that guy back there. So anyway... <laughs> He's a, yes, it's wrong. I mean, you know, what, what, was, what, do, you, what do you think was going on? Like, you know, and they hadn't had any kids yet. It's not like the kids are going to be looking at them, you know. It's just a bunch of animals around there. Who was it? You suppose it was the monkeys pointing at them and laughing at them? I, you know. But why? Why? Be, why did they hide themselves and cover? Because of shame and fear. Because there was a sense of shame, and we've all carried that shame ever since the fall of the first family, the fallen family. We carry the sense of shame over our nakedness, both physical nakedness and our spiritual nakedness. Obviously, there's a point we should have modesty, but there was this sense of shame that came with this sin. Isaiah 61.10 in the middle of that verse, uh, it says this. It says, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. So what are we talking about? Garments, the clothing. It's spiritual clothing, the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness. That's only through salvation in one name, Jesus, only the blood of Jesus that is the righteousness of God through us, Christ Jesus putting that robe on us by faith as we run to Jesus. So in the Revelation Scripture, he's not talking about the shame of a physical, physical nakedness that needed to be covered, but spiritual nakedness. When Revelation mentions the white raiment that we're to be clothed in, uh, he's, he's talking about spiritual, the garment of salvation, the robe of righteousness. And the only answer for our shame is Jesus, his righteousness, his robe. We can never become righteous enough, listen to this, to overcome our own shame. You cannot change and get pure enough and right enough to then not feel ashamed. No way. You can't do it. You will, you will have that sense of shame. You won't get there. You know, well, I was saved when I was young. And I, I, I made mistakes, a lot of them, because I wasn't equipped. No one taught me. No one shared with me how to be an overcomer. No one put the word and hid the word in my heart. And I, I did a lot of sinning after I was saved. And I dealt throughout my life, even as I got into ministry, even though in my mind I know, but this guilt, this shame that just overwhelmed me and just stole my peace and stole my joy. And I tried hard to fix myself. It, you know, it, I was oh so guilty. I needed ministry, ministry of God's spirit. I needed ministry of man to help me. You know, and uh, the enemy used to just beat me up. One, one of my favorite songs is, is, is this old song that you young people, you'll love this. It goes, I should have been crucified. Oh, I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. 
But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. It's Jesus' righteousness is the only answer to take care of our shame. It's Him. And how many of you have sinned since you were saved? Since you got saved, you sinned, and you struggled with a sense of guilt and shame. How many, maybe you haven't fallen into sexual sin, but you've really blown it. Maybe it's a, a sins of the mind or, or whatever else it might be or are just a lot of different things and maybe addictions and different kinds or, or problems with attitude and how you treat people with your words. How many of you know you sin and you know you've blown it really bad? And uh, I just, I want to ask you, since you were saved, you really sin and you struggle with this shame. Just lift your hand. I'd like for up high. I just want to hold it there a second. I want everybody to look around. Look at this. Hold it up there. Be honest. Look around. We've got a church full of sinners here at New Hope. <laughs> Listen, if Jesus didn't forgive sin that you committed after you were saved, we'd all be in a lot of trouble, wouldn't we? But he's forgiven it. As far as the east is from the west, he, we confess our sins. He's faithful to just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The reason I had you raise your hand is because here's what Satan does to you when you sin after you're saved. He'll say, there's nobody else as bad as you. No one else has blown it as bad as you. What were you thinking? How could you do that? God's not going to forgive you. You're doomed. You can just forget it. And who are you to be in the ministry after the stupidity that you've done? Who are you to ever talk to anybody about God? He'll shut your mouth. He'll steal your joy. He'll steal your peace. And he will put the accusing finger on you the rest of your life. And he says, you're just a bad person. The answer is exactly right. But, but God, the blood of Jesus has cleansed my sin. And he saved me. And, he, and, he, and, and, and I, I, am, I am his. And... Uh, if he, doesn't, if he doesn't forgive us, like I said, we're all in trouble. Jesus bore our sin on the cross, and he bore our shame. And thank God for the blood of Jesus that cleanses every stain and removes the shame of it, and you don't have to be afraid. Sin, in a moment, came to this every family and brought fear and brought shame. And Jesus is here to forgive us and set us free from fear and shame. Next we see sin immediately brought blame. In verse 11, it says, and he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so, the, so then uh, the next verses deal with the consequences that Adam and Eve brought upon themselves by rebelling against God's command. Notice the separation that sins brings. Immediately they're separated from God, but they're also separated from each other. Adam and Eve, Eve have shame because they were separated from God. Now Adam and Eve are fractured and they cast blame. In one sentence, Adam cast blame on two people. Adam says, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me, God, I was doing fine with the chimpanzees, God, and it wasn't until she showed up and you gave her to me. This is all your fault, and it's the woman's fault. You know, isn't it true that we, you know, we're messed up, we blame God or we blame somebody else? If I'd have just been raised different, if that wouldn't happen to me, that this person had done this to me, I don't know what's wrong with God. Why didn't God do this and we blame God? So sad, blaming it's one of the worst things we can do. The Bible says to be humble and fall on our knees and be honest and ask God to help us and forgive us. And in one sentence, blame is cast on two people. If you fall to shame, you'll fall to blame. Whatever happened to me, it's somebody else's fault. And if it isn't, then it's all my fault, and that's really bondage. It's all my fault, and you just beat yourself up, and you'll never believe that ever you're any good for anything or have a purpose or that God would ever forgive you. Sin causes us to be separated from God and each other. And who do we want to blame when we mess up? Not ourselves. Let me tell you, I've been bad about this too. <laughs> I've been bad at shame and I've been bad at blame. You know, something doesn't get done, well, who is supposed to do that? Something goes wrong, well, whose fault is that? Something I'd, something I'd do, I, I'd go, well, I wouldn't have done that if not, you know, if this hadn't happened. And so... I'm asking God to help me with that and to be more gracious, you know, not, 
not when someone else forgets something or doesn't do something. Well, I, I know in my head people are human, but sometimes I expect them not to be human somehow, and I cast blame when something goes bad, goes wrong. Listen, nobody here is perfect. We need to be gracious and forgive each other and not blame each other and not accuse each other. And uh, our kids pick it up when we play the blame game. We're never wrong, then they're never wrong. Somebody else's fault, it's somebody else's fault. Like the young teenage daughter that called her dad and said, uh, somebody stole my phone, dad. An hour later, she texts her dad and says, dad, that person that stole my phone put it in the bottom of my purse. I got it. Another word for blame is accusation. Where does that word come from? Accusation. We accuse people. You know where accusation comes from? The accuser of the brethren, Satan himself. The accuser, he points a finger, Revelation says, and accuses. See, there's shame, and then there's blame, and then another sin problem that entered is fame. Our pride of life. I want to be known. I want to be somebody. I want to be recognized. I want to look at me. I want to be important. And in verses 14 to 19, God outlines the curses that, that Adam and Eve brought upon themselves. And they're huge. But look at verse 20 after that. Notice what Adam did immediately after hearing the consequences of sin. Verse 20 of, of, of Genesis 3. Right after the consequences of sin, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Why did he name her Eve? Because she would become the mother of all the living. Hmm. What do you think of that? Doesn't sound too bad, does it? I mean, what's really happening here? Adam immediately, here's what happens. He immediately separates from his wife. Her identity was mother. And you may not know this, but God didn't name her Eve. How many knew that? God didn't name her Eve. God didn't name her that. We just read it. Adam named her, and it was after the curse of sin. Notice that? And not woman, not Eve, not bone of bone. I mean, her, her name was, look at Genesis 5-2. Now, in the other versions, they'll translate this word man, but the original language actually is right. The King James Version has it correctly. In Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, look, look, it says, male and female created he them and blessed them, and he called who? Their name, Adam. Look at that. He called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Their name. Her name was Adam female, Adam woman. His name was Adam male, Adam man. Do you see that? They were so much one, they weren't separated. They were bone of bone and flesh of flesh. One man, he called her because he came out of man. And they were one like this. They were Adam together. Adam. And then the relationship was broken by sin, and Adam immediately names her Eve. Significant. Sin has consequence. Always breaks relationships. You are Eve, the mother of all living, he says, well, in chapter 2, he says we're one. In chapter 3, he says we're different. You're Eve, the mother of all the living. Well, what's bad about that? Women are mothers, but look closer. He's just labeling her. He's just saying, let me tell you what your job is, woman. Your job is to give me kids. That's what he's saying. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a mother. In fact, it's a high calling. It's a beautiful thing as well as father, isn't it? Women have been struggling with, with this for 6,000 years. Is this my purpose on earth, just to bear kids? I'm just a baby-producing machine? Now, I don't, you know, my only purpose is to bear kids. That's why a lot of women go through depression when the kids get raised and they get out of the house. The kids leave because they have, they have no, they fulfilled their purpose. There's nothing left for them. Listen, ladies, this is not your purpose, your sole purpose. It's not. In the, in, in the kingdom of God, in, in Jesus Christ, there's no male or free, there's no male or female, no Greek or Jew, no slave, and no free. We are one. And every person, both man and a woman, have a calling, have a gifting, have a purpose on this earth. 
And, and uh, being a father, being a mother is a high calling, but it's not all there is. It is not your call. Some people struggle when their wife finds an anointed calling and ministry and are used of God. And ladies, you're all meant to be used of God in some area. It doesn't mean it's public, but there's some area. You know, and sometimes I struggle with Susan's gifting and calling, her Holy Spirit gift. You know what it is? How many even know who she is? Is she in here? Stand up back there, Susan Waver. I, look, she's going, oh, no. Come on, stand up. Wave like a parade woman, Queen, Queen Susan. There she is. She's, she's alive and well on planet Earth. But Susan has a gifting of mercy. And she's always leaving me for someone who's going through a terrible time. Maybe they just lost meeting them for supper. Maybe they just lost their spouse after many, many years. Or they've just gone through a divorce. Or they've got a child that's wavered and they're just needing to talk. And that's just what she does. She listens better than anybody I know. You just talk to her one time. And unless you ask her something, she'll never talk about herself. And she'll ask you six zillion questions. I know because I come home to them. And she... <laughs> She will find everything out because she cares about people and she's a good listener. And But sometimes I complain because she says, well, I got an appointment. Well, I said, well, I didn't know, you know, because I wanted to be all about me, you know. I wanted, you know. And, and so, but you see, Jesus said there's no male nor female. Not that male and female aren't different. They are. And we have a different function in many ways, but we're all part of the body of Christ. Remember that illustration Paul uses that, you know, we're all like not, if everybody was an eye, where would the hearing be, you know, you know, and so forth. And he talked about even the toes are important. Most men want the women to stay as toes. They want all the women to be toes, right? Because, because that's just the nature of man. And you, you'll see that in just a second. I'm, I'm just telling you. They're, they're, but women aren't second-class citizens, See, the male dominance is a problem because it's a curse of sin, but we're not under that curse. We're children of God. We're redeemed. We shouldn't treat women the way that other cultures and other religions treat women. It's wrong. I know that being a mother is a high calling. It's very important, but it's not the only calling. And staying at home full-time as a mother is a great thing. But those women that are, have the Spirit of God, they do more. Like my daughter-in-law, she does much more than just stay home and watch kids. She has a ministry. Not paid for it anymore, but she has a ministry, and she ministers to people, old and young alike, whoever she can, because God's Spirit is in her, and there's a high calling of God and a purpose for her life. And they're being used of God in unique giftings, anointed, serving the church and their community with God's love. And you, you see our highest calling is that of being, it is to being a child of God. We even say it, God, family, business, God first, and that's it. That's it. We all have a call of God, every man and every woman. And as children see the call of God lived out in our life, listen to this, as children see the call of God lived out in our life, they learn to serve God and they desire to be used of God. And if you want to write something down, this is the most important statement I'm going to make this morning. If we make our children the center of our universe, they will not learn to make God the center of their universe. It was Jesus that said, if you love God, your mother or your father, your brother, your sister, your husband or your wife, or even your own life more than me, you're not worthy of me. He's saying that God is the object of worship. There'll be no other gods before me but God. And we will teach our children if we dote on them, over dote on them, and make life everything about them, trying to give them everything they want, always give them every privilege, every opportunity that's alive in this world. They play 25 sports, and they're involved in 15 different musical events, and they're in drama and everything else because they're the center of our universe instead of God being the center of our universe to teach them. And part of the fall, guys, listen, is women being relegated to only being baby makers, and it's not true. Every child wants to have a purpose. Every woman has a purpose. And being a mother and having children is a high calling of God, but there's even more. You know, and our children, it, it works the same principle about, about fame, works with our kids. Our kids want to be something. When I grew up, I'm going to be somebody, you know. And this whole spirit of competition is, is in this whole thing. Every child wants to have a purpose, to have significance. And we label people. We say, oh, that's so Smith's boy over there. Yes, he is. But that boy is different than his daddy. 
He has a different gifting, a different calling. He's not to be identified as the person's son or someone's brother or sister or whatever. He shouldn't be made to compare, to be compared to what his father has done or is doing or compared to his sister who can outsing anybody on the planet. Austin, I know you'd suffer for extreme insecurity if you try to compare yourself to your sister's singing. His value is that God has a purpose and a gifting and a calling, and it's the same for women. They all have a purpose. And one of the curses of sin was competition, comparing ourselves among ourselves. And Paul, so Paul says that's unwise. It leads to, to sin and broken relationships. And kids rebel. Listen to me. They rebel if they start comparing themselves. They start trying to live up to what their parents are. They try to get in this competition thing because they're always going to lose because there's always somebody better than them. But God has just made them who they are. They just need to rest in that. And this comparison competition game we find ourselves in will create problems with our children and our families. Each person is special and unique. They're different. They don't have to be the same. You've heard people say, oh, Tom, well, he's the black sheep of the family. He always done his own thing, gone his own way. In other words, he's made bad choices. Why? Because he's not going to be just like his sister who's perfect. He's looking for significance. He's trying to be different. He's competing for attention. It's a significance, and he has to act out if he's going to find that attention. Listen to me. God has a purpose that is a godly purpose for each person, and if we don't teach our children this, then we're going to mess them up. They need to understand they're not to be compared. They're not, one's not better than the other. If a person's athletic and the other person's music, it's okay. We're all different. God has a purpose and you're unique and you made just the way God wanted you. Don't try to copy anybody else or compete with another or compare yourself. God, you're exactly how God intended. Look at, look at what verse 16 says in relation to fame. Look at the verse 16 in our text. You desi your desire, this is part of the curse in Genesis 3 that, that, that Adam and Eve brought on themselves. You desire shall be for your husbands, and he shall rule over you. This is part of the curse. Men, we're to be servant leaders, not rule over our wives. But a part of the curse is that we want to rule, and that's why you have godless religions that treat women like they're objects. They're nothing, no respect. And that's why in evangelicalism, you have scriptures like Ephesians 5 taught wrong. We're talking about the man being the leader of the house. It's talking about total wrong attitude and spirit there. It's totally wrong. You see, it says, your desire shall be for your husbands. That word desire there is Hebrew, teshukah. It means to be independent from and to dominate. To be independent from your desire, you're to be independent, your desire women, to be independent from and to dominate. In other words, women, part of the curse is that you want to dominate your husband and be independent from him. You think there's any marital problems because of that kind of stuff? Absolutely. And the men want to dominate the woman because that's what it says. The man is stronger. So that's part of the curse. Conflict, brokenness. That's what Adam and Eve brought upon themselves and on us. But listen to me. In Christ, the curse is broken. In Christ, we don't dominate each other. We serve and love each other. The root of this word speaks of competition. Cain and Abel in the next chapter, brothers, competing and they're competing about the best offering. And Cain competed and got, made, uh, got mad, rather, and he murdered his brother. We see it in our kids, the competition. You know, we see it when they grow up. They work hard. They do work when they should be being with their family. They work so hard. Why? Because, well, maybe it's the wife wanting them to have the biggest house. You know, they want all the stuff. So they send their husband to work, and then they expect him to be with the family too. And how can the guy do all this and do this too? And then they compare. Well, look at our house. Look at our car. Look at our clothes. And they're competing. And the children talk to each other, and they drop little things, you know, about how, what they've done and what they're going to get next and all of this kind of thing. And then they say, like, like Grandpa Weaver, they say, you know, Paisley's only three months. She's already talking. She knows the word. She said, A. I bet you she'll know the whole alphabet in just another week or so. Smartest baby girl ever lived. And we compete. We compare. But listen to me. We need to remember something. God has a special purpose for us. And it's individual and it's personal. And it's not about being male or female. 
And uh, Jesus was born. I'm going to give you one more thing about family. Do you remember Jesus was born into a family? Uh Uh-huh. Because he comes to heal broken and splintered families. He was born into a family to undo the curse of sin. And if you have problems, more of Jesus is the answer, less of you. Your strong will, desire to dominate can be surrendered to Jesus today. I want you to look at Acts 3.25, which is quoting Old Testament. And, it, and it's, uh, it, and actually the original version says, and in your seed, Acts 3.25 is quoting, and in your seed, what's the seed of Abraham? The seed, Jesus. All the families of the earth will be blessed. He's saying in Jesus, all families will be blessed. You realize that? It's prophesying the Messiah. In that seed, all families will be blessed. Listen to me. If you'll let Jesus set you free from shame, it'll take care of a lot of your problems, your conflicts, and, and, and the brokenness. It really will. When you really fully experience love and forgiveness and cleansing, you will love and forgive. When shame is removed, you quit, you quit being so combative and blaming others, and you don't have this negative guilt that then reflects on others. When you're mean to yourself, you're mean to others. When you're unhappy, you're unhappy with others. You need to get free and be joyful and have peace once again and let shame be removed and it'll do a lot of good to fixing the problems that families have between husband and wife and parents and children and children back to their parents. And you really experience God's love and God's forgiveness and cleansing, you will love and you will forgive. When shame is removed, you'll quit being so combative and quit blaming other people for your failures and frustrations and sins. I close with this story. How many of you know who Daniel Webster was? Young people, you know who Daniel Webster is? Hey, raise your hand if you do. Be careful, I might call on you. Our education process is forgetting godly people that left a mark on the earth, and you no longer use the Webster Dictionary. You use Google, Google, brain dead Google. That's half the time wrong. Okay, Webster, Christian man, godly man. And Mr. Webster was dying, and he called his doctor, and he says, I want you to read my favorite hymn to me. And the hymn was written by a man by the name, and I'll put this picture up here, William Cowper, C-O-W-P-E-R, William Cowper. See, William Cowper uh, had a very bad immoral past. In fact, when he was between the ages of 32 and 34, he uh, he was actually put in a sane society. And John Newton, who wrote uh, Amazing Grace, ministered to him, and they became friends. And together, they wrote several, John Newton wrote more than Cowper, several hymns and, and ministered to him. And, uh, but he had a horrible, this absolutely overwhelmingly horrible guilt of his immoral past. And he got saved, began to live for God, and God blessed him. He got a law degree, and, and he didn't really do much with it, but it, it led to him getting a position as a clerk for the house of lords and he was so excited until he found out that as a clerk he had to go before a public examination among the community and they would ask questions all about his past and he he got so filled with shame and fear and got so depressed that he decided to kill himself he went to the town to the tower a very high tower he went up a little ways and he decided I got fear of heights this is not a good way to kill myself I'll find another way so he came back down, and uh, he decided, I'm going to just get a bottle of poison and kill myself. And he got the bottle, and he was walking, and he dropped it, and it broke, and all the poison spilled out. That didn't work. So he thought, well, I'll just hang myself. So he went and got a rope, put it on there, jumped down, and, and the crossbar broke. <laughs> He's going, huh, I'm getting tired. So he thinks, I'll just get a knife and stab myself. And he got a knife. It must, I don't know what the wrong with the knife, but he tried to kill himself. I don't know if he hit something or what, but this true story, it broke. He was so exasperated and so tired, he went and laid down and he fell asleep. And he woke up at three o'clock in the morning with these words going through his mind. And he began to write, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. You know, Emmanuel means God with us. It's the name they called Jesus, Emmanuel. Drawn from Jesus' veins, Emmanuel's veins. And sinners, you and me, New Hope sinners, plunged beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. See, Cowper had been stained 
impacted, marked by sin, the shame of it. And God set him free that day from his shame of his past. And so he decided to go to the public examination for the job. And he told all of his past. He answered all the questions. And he told how Jesus' blood cleanses him from sin. He told and witnessed. And many people came to Jesus Christ through that. And it was reported that many came to faith and found the same freedom from their shame throughout his life. The sad thing is, some theologian taught him the doctrine of election. That some are made for hell and some are made for heaven. And as he got older, he just, the devil kept pounding him and pounding him. And he, toward the end of his life, became convinced that he was made for hell. You know what God says? He says it's not his will that any perish but that all have everlasting life. And if you're sitting here today and you think because you've sinned horribly since you were saved that God won't forgive you and cleanse you and welcome you as a child of God, then you're mistaken. And that's the voice of the devil that lied to this Mr. William Cowper. He died fearful of his eternity. But I'm telling you today, as you bow your heads, if you will, to respect your neighbor and close your eyes. If you have anything you need to be set free from today, he'll do it. What tendency do you still see that's in your life that's from the fall, the curse of the fall of the first family? Do you struggle with shame, with fear, with guilt? Maybe about the sins you did after you receive Christ? Do you struggle with blame? It's always someone else's fault. I'm not here. I'm here because of what someone else did to me. Or you're mad at, mad at God, blaming God. Do you struggle with fame and having insecurity and inferiority and identity crisis and you want to be known for something? You want to be somebody? You're just struggling with that pride of life? God's here to set you free from the curse of the fall of the first family. And if you need to come, pray. Maybe you need a job. Maybe you need healing. Maybe you have a relationship that needs to be made right. Maybe you need to ask Jesus to forgive sin. Maybe you need to just come and receive the forgiveness of sin and removal of shame.